Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We thank God for his goodness, for his grace, and for all that he does continually to bless his people, those whom he has chosen to be in his family. By his great and awesome grace, we praise his awesome name. We thank God for each and every one of you that are here. We bless the Lord for you. It's always a joy uh, to be in the house of the Lord and to celebrate all that he does on an ongoing basis to bless his people. Thank you, Jesus. You know, when we, when we sing those songs, uh, at least sing the, the national anthem, the African uh, or the African American, the African or the black national anthem, whatever you want to call it. It really helps us to grab a hold uh, to an understanding of where we've come from, what we've come through. Um, we, we, must, we must never forget uh, the, the road that we have trod. Uh, the things that our ancestors have endured, uh, the, 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 the times that they have literally uh, spent, uh, and the things that they have gone through uh, to literally procure a better future for us. Uh, it is important that we never forget it. Amen. Amen. We must never forget. Um, because these atrocities that we know that are past, that in some form now are still continuing in some places, we must ever be mindful to recognize the enemy and what he's doing so that we will be faithful to stand on the truth and stay faithful to prayer that this great God that we serve will do what he does so marvelously and wonderful uh, to bring about justice in this land for the glory of his name. Amen. Let us never forget, but let us stay true to our great King and to our great God. Amen. I want to share a message with you today. Uh, I'm going to pray a brief prayer, and then we're going to look at this uh, sermon that I'm going to share with you. And uh, the simple title for my sermon today is Love Your Enemy. And uh, I want to share from that, uh, from that theme, all right? Father, we thank you today. We thank you because, God, we recognize that through your word and through your awesome love, we can live our lives wrapped up in you, which is the best thing that we could possibly do. And you made that possible through the death of your own son in our stead, that we could have a new life that we can have abundant life and that we could have eternal life and it all comes from you. God, we want to be able to live in this life even though we're faced with tremendous challenges, sometimes injustices. But we're asking for your help that you might help us to live in such a way that we can affect the greatest good because that's your way and we're asking that you'll stamp this into our very hearts on our minds and our spirit that we will get what you want us to get out of this message and that we'll, we'll live it out we won't just ponder it we won't just think about it we won't just talk about it we'll live it out and so we're asking you, God, to anoint our time together that this word may find a lodging place in our hearts and begin to filter down into our very lives in order that we might live out the truth of it. Be with us now as we place ourselves in your hands and entrust this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise him. Love your enemies. Amen. Would you, would you do me a favor and just lean over to your neighbor and say, love your enemy.
And then just simply say to them, this is not what pastor said. This is what Jesus said. Amen. Now let me let me start out by simply saying I was um I can't remember where I was and that's not really important but I overheard uh some people talk about uh this whole idea of loving your enemies. And one of the guys said, well, you know the the Bible says that if somebody slaps you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. And they said, I only got one cheek. <laughs> Oftentimes, we misunderstand uh, what Jesus really is saying. And that's why I think we suffer so greatly in some of the situations we find ourselves in. Let me preface everything that I'm about to say with this. Jesus said what he said because it brings the best possible outcome. Come on now. I, I'm, I'm trying to help somebody. I, I've said this before, and, and some of you didn't get it before. And I fear that you won't get it this time either, uh, because it's not just something you want to get. How many of you are familiar with the story of the Hatfields and the McCoys. At least you've heard the story, right? I would imagine they're still fighting because they decided that they weren't going to do what Jesus said, so they have embraced the outcome of a different reality. See, Jesus is trying to save you years of war when you can end it in a moment by taking a minor wrong. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Because he knew that if you hit back, the person that decides to hit you back again is going to hit you harder than what you hit them. Amen, somebody. And that's exactly what's happening on the streets in Los Angeles with gang activity. Every time they hit back, they're trying to hit back harder, thinking that somehow it's going to stop them from hitting back again. And it just escalates. So Jesus helps us to understand that if you want to get rid of a whole lot of craziness, madness, and war, find out how to love your enemy rather than hitting out at your enemy because you'll have the best result if you love them. I didn't see you taking notes. You need to take some notes. Because if you want to live in peace, you're going to have to find a way to love your enemies even if your enemies don't love you. Amen? I was looking at a movie the other night uh, in celebration of Black History Month. How many of you have seen the movie The Best of Enemies? N nobody in the room has seen the movie? That's shocking. I would have thought somebody would have seen the movie. The movie came out uh, last year in April, 2019 in April. I'm kind of glad you have it now. I can share it. The best of enemies. Now, let me give you a little quick synopsis of the movie first before I get into the four principles uh, that I see in the movie. The movie is not a Christian movie. That's probably why some of you haven't seen it. It's a good movie. Uh, even though it was a box office flop and, and they, they didn't even make more money than, you know, they expanded on the movie. That's why it was a flop. But the movie has powerful principles running through it, okay? The movie, basically, the two main characters, and this is a true story. It's not just a movie. It's a true story from 1971 in the city of Durham, North Carolina, when the uh, integration of schools had already been passed into law by the federal government. And now there were some holdout uh, towns and some holdout cities that really were trying to hold on as long as possible without obeying uh, what the federal government had laid down as legislature and law. 
So in in Durham, uh, there's this lady, her name, this is a true story, her real name was Ann Atwater. Might want to write that down, Ann Atwater. And then there was another principal character in the movie, his name was C.P. Ellis. Ann Atwater was a civil rights activist, uh, very, very prominent in the Durham community with trying to uh, make sure that African Americans had the same kinds of rights and privileges as whites in the community. So she was working for uh, people in relationship to housing, school issues, and everything else. C.P. Ellis was the president of the local Klan gang. This is a true, I'm telling you a true story, okay? Yeah, this is, this is a powerful movie. Um, the, I, I would imagine it was a flop in the box office because for the most part, whites don't want to go to a movie where they're made to feel bad about what their foreparents did. And so people don't really want to go and watch that. And a lot of blacks don't want to go because they know that whites are going to call them the N-word in the movie. And there's a lot of N-word in the movie. I, I suffered through it, but it was worth it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you still with me? You remember the movie, Darylin? All right, Darylin says she remembers the movie, and uh, that's good because um, she, she also remembered the address of the church and got here today, and that's, that's good, too. Uh, that's good. But let's... Let, <laughs> Friend, let, me pat her on her, let me pat her on her back. She did, she did well and found her way here. You know, old, old people like Daryl, and you got to give them some help to get to where they got to go. But, but this is how the movie goes. Listen to me carefully so that I, I hope you'll watch it. I'm not going to tell you what the whole movie was about, but I just want to tell you about the central issues in the movie, okay? They were having some major issues, and the African-American community recognizing that the white community in Durham were not sort of flowing with what the federal government had brought down as law, they began to do some protesting and demand that these things take effect. And the local judge who was trying to administer all of this, I uh, was trying to figure out how he could do this, and, a, and an attorney who knew a facilitator who did charrettes, I'll tell you what a charrette is in just a moment, uh, was a friend of his in college, and he had some progress and some success with doing it in other counties and asked the judge if it was okay if his friend came down who was an African-American, this lawyer was white, and uh, if he could come down and run one of these charrettes in the community with all of the people in the community to come together, okay? The judge agreed. Uh, this guy came down from Raleigh. Um, as a matter of fact, he came up from Raleigh because Raleigh is actually more southern than Durham is. He came up from Raleigh and began to invite people to participate in this forum in the community, uh, both whites and blacks. Got it? And so uh, they began to take a look at appointing people that would sit on the panel uh, that would, at the end of all of this and all of the information gathering, that they will make a decision to vote on the resolutions that were before the people. And uh, when they did this, uh, they approached, first of all, uh, this woman, Ann Atwater, who was an activist in the community for the civil rights movement. And then they decided that they would approach the Klan leader to have him on the panel as well because the whites did not want liberal whites to be on the panel. Because they knew that if they were liberal whites they would give in and basically vote for all of these uh, resolutions so that blacks could not get what they needed to get. You got it? And so uh, some of the uh, very high oppers in the community talked to the Klan leader because he was very influential and they knew his stand and that he wouldn't give in uh, and that he would basically uh, influence the other whites on the panel because there were six blacks and six whites on the panel. And then they would have to vote at the end. Now, I'm going to share some things with you, and I want you to write these down uh, because these are the principles, the power principles that I get from the movie that are biblical. I said the movie is not a Christian movie, but the principles that I see in the movie are Christian principles. First of all, I want you to write down, number one, the power of engagement. The power of engagement. 
Number two, the power of loving deeds. Number three, the power of truth and justice. And then number four, the power of forgiveness and grace. Okay, you got it? Or you want me to say it again? Okay. Number one, the power of engagement. Number two, the power of loving deeds. Number three, the power of truth and justice. And then the power of forgiveness and grace. Those are the four uh, that I want to talk about. I'm hoping that I'll be able to do this uh, in, a, in a brief uh, time or short time. Uh, my wife reminded me again this morning that I said I was going to preach shorter and I haven't been faithful to it. Um, and so I'll, I'll try uh, harder this week. Amen. <laughs> I don't know why I keep on having people around me that's keeping me accountable for <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> all right, real quickly, let me share first of all what a charrette is. A charrette is a coming together of people uh, concerning a particular project for them to sort of hash out the issues and then together map out solutions for how we can take care of this issue. That's what a charrette is. And so the guy that's brought in from Raleigh is a facilitator of a charrette to bring people, every person in the community that felt they had a stake in what was going to be decided upon, had the opportunity to come to the meeting at this, in the school auditorium. There were hundreds of people there. Uh, the whites sat on one side because they didn't want to sit with the blacks. The blacks sat on the other side, and they were totally uh, distant from each other and, and, and spoke about each other badly. Uh, they were using the N-word even in the meeting uh, that they were having. Uh, this, again, it was uh, probably about three years. 1971 was about three years after Martin Luther King was assassinated and Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. You might remember that both of them were assassinated. Uh, Martin Luther King, April 1968. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy in June of 1968, just a few months later. Both of them were assassinated very close to one another. This is just three years removed from that and so this this heated tension is still going on in the south okay and 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 in some places in the north but this is this is a hotbed of of activity going on in Durham at the time especially because of the issue of school integration and so this, this uh, guy's name was Bill Riddick, who was brought in as the facilitator over this charrette. And he uh, has people go out and they're inviting all of the people in the community to come to this so that they can come together and begin to discuss the issues that are taking place and how they can resolve these issues in their community. This is something that, uh, Leon, I don't know that I'm going to be able to finish this this week, so I might have to do it uh, the following week, but I, I want to do justice to it, okay? And so if I feel like I'm going too long and my wife will wink at me and let me know, uh, I'll cut it off and we'll pick it up next week. But, but this is the first thing that I want you to see in this, is the power of engagement. That's exactly what happened. He decided to bring people together because he had already done it a number of times and saw how successful it was. Watch this. Because what he found out is, is that as long as people are apart from one another, they will not understand one another. Neither will they ever seek solutions to come together because they don't understand each other. What, what he found out is, is that stereotypes exist as long as people never get together and really understand why people think the way they think and why they act the way they act and what they do. So when he brought them together, it began a dialogue of people beginning to hear well, how other people think, why they do what they do, what their concerns are, what their family issues are, what their fears are. Once they began to come together and interact with one another, they began to understand better the issues and why these issues need to be addressed and resolved. One of the worst things that could happen to a church in a diverse community is to stay by themselves because they'll always talk badly about the people that's in the community that's not like them. 
But as soon as we get outside of ourselves and begin to reach out to other people, we'll begin to understand that other people have a lot of common things with us. There are differences, but most of what they love and want and desire are similar to us. They want their children to be safe. We want our children to be safe. They want to have jobs where they can make ends meet. So do we. We want to live in safe neighborhoods. So do they. We find that when we come together and engage with one another, then we hear the other side and we become more empathetic in relationship to what other people are going through. Leah is called doing life with other people when we do life with other people we begin to feel their hurts they begin to feel ours we begin to make a common bond with one another where we can now trust one another and dialogue with one another to help one another if we stay apart and continue to dismiss them all we'll ever do is talk badly about them and we'll never understand why they operate the way that they operate Boy, we have an excellent example of this, don't we? In John chapter 4, with Jesus and the Samaritan woman, here are two different groups of people represented. Jesus, for her, is representing the Jews. And this woman is representing the Samaritans. And there has been a division between the Samaritans and the Jews for centuries. Come on, somebody. I said for centuries. And all they ever did, watch this, all they ever did was to stay to themselves and talk badly about each other. That was their history. They just stayed separated and all they ever did was down one another, point fingers and accuse one another of being bad toward the other group. So, so, so Jesus, knowing the power of engagement, decided to meet this woman at the well and to do something for this woman that would break down the stereotypes and gauge the woman and have the woman open up to the reality that these people who may be different to her, there are some people who are willing to take the chance and the opportunity to break down the stereotypes, to break down the issues and to get beyond the madness and the craziness so that we don't have to fight for every generation in the future. So when the charrette started, we had people that were sitting, as I said, on one side that were white and on the other side people that were black or of color. And then they began to the facilitated began to bring up the issues, the main issues that he was there to have them help them to resolve. And as I said before, there was some, some ugly name calling, uh, some language that was just not even necessary for a meeting like that because it wasn't going to help in any way or do any good. Uh, people were saying things from, from prejudice and stereotypical madness and craziness that was not taking the meeting anywhere that it would need to go that was positive. Okay, you got it? And then after a while, uh, people started expressing what their concerns were, and then people started to sort of uh, say what their concerns were, and people started to listen to what the real issues were, and, and they were making some progress. And they were meeting once a week for about two hours for several weeks uh, to just get dialogue, uh, it, some interaction between them, and some healthy discussion. After a while... The facilitator recognized in order to take this another step, when they broke to eat together, he made sure that they were paired up with somebody from the other race. So you couldn't sit with just all whites, couldn't sit with just all blacks. And what he decided to do was he decided to sit the clan leader. This guy was the president of the local clan chapter. President filled with rage, hate, and a whole ton of prejudice. He, he walks into the room because he doesn't know who he's sitting with, and, and, and they got name tags on the table. So he's walking around with his tray, and he's looking for his name tag, and when he sees the name tag and who he's sitting with is the civil rights activist woman, Ann Atwater. <laughs> 
He reluctantly, and it's funny because when you watch the movie, anytime he's doing anything where he's interacting with blacks, he's looking around the room to see which whites are looking at him. Because he doesn't want to be seen with anybody of that persuasion. And so he reluctantly takes his seat, and then she comes and takes her seat, and they're forced. I mean, they're face to face. There's only a table for two. And so they're sitting across from one another, and they're in close proximity. And, he, and it, you could tell it's, it's disturbing him that he's sitting at the same table as blacks. As a matter of fact, when they first decided to, to have this gathering, uh, he invited the black civil rights activist woman, Ann Atwater, and this Klan leader to come and have lunch with him. They agreed to come, and when the, um, the, the Klan leader came in into the restaurant, he comes in and he's looking over the whole restaurant to see if there's any Klan members there because he doesn't want to be seen meeting at the same table as two black people. So, so what he does is he pulls up a Leon, he pulls up a chair at another table that is somewhat close to that table, and they're meeting with him way over here, and they're at this table. That's how he was. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah, this movie, is, this movie is something else. It might have been a bo box office flop, but I think this movie is great because it helps us to see how we deal with one another and the prejudices we have and why we never move from, play, from point A to point B. Come on now. So, so they began to interact. Now, now this is what happens as they begin to interact. Now they're, they're eating at the same tables as people from another race. And, and he said, you cannot, in, at these uh, table gatherings, you cannot talk about the issues we were talking about in the meeting. So watch this now. Now you got to talk about family. Now you got to talk about life. Now you got to talk about other issues. See, now, now they're getting to dialogue with one another about common things that they operate in and do. Because the issues, they are hot, hot button issues. He didn't want them fighting at the table and forget that they're to eat and to talk about life. So he told, you can't talk about the issues. So just talk about common life. Come on, somebody. And, 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 the, and the clan leader and the activist, they ain't talking at all. She's, she's tough. She's, she's, she's a tough, hard, tough woman. And he is a racist to the core. Hates even being at the table. And every day, every time they come together, they have to sit together. And look one another in the face and try to try not to say anything to one another. And then after a while, they start talking. Power of engagement. Power of engagement. Power of engagement. If you want to be a person that makes disciples of all nations, you're going to have to understand the power of engagement. Come on, somebody. All right, how am I doing time-wise? Am I, am I all right so far? Nobody ready to leave quite yet? Okay. I said that the, the John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman at the well, was a, a, a fitting example of what the power of engagement looks like when you have two people representing two separate entities when they come together. Remember now, Jesus initiated the contact. I want you to see that. If you are staying on your side of town hoping that some white person is going to come all the way over there to see you, you're probably going to be there all by yourself for the rest of your life. He initiated contact, and this is what he said to his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria because God had made an appointment for him to meet up with this woman to break down the stereotypes. Watch this. Watch this now. Jesus is not so much meeting with this woman to break down the stereotypes that she held about Jews. He's breaking down the stereotypes that his own disciples had about Samaritans. Come on, Come on now. 
Remember now, and I'm not going to stay on this story because this story is not what I'm preaching about. Remember now that when Jesus was talking to her and the disciples came back, remember the scripture says they looked and wondered why on earth was he talking to this woman? She's a woman for one and she's a Samaritan. The look on their faces caused the woman to drop her water pot and go. As long as Jesus was talking to her, she was okay with staying because she recognized he wanted to talk to her. He valued her. He loved her and wanted the best for her. But his disciples were perplexed that he would even think to talk to a Samaritan. Power of engagement. Jesus was teaching them the power of engagement. This, this is what Jesus is, is really saying. Hey, guys, if you would just take the time to take out some time to just sit with these people and love on these people and seek to help these people, you'd be surprised how they might respond to you. Amen. I'm going to say something that might hurt your feelings. If you would take some time to sit down and engage some people of another nationality, race, or ethnic group, you might make some friends who will treat you better than a lot of black people will. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I hurt your feelings? I'm just telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. You might find that you might make some lifetime friends and you got some black folk in the community having treated you right your whole life. I'm not downing my people. I'm just telling you the truth. Power of engagement. Let me go on to the next one. And then if, if I'm almost running out of time, I'll, I'll leave the next two for next week. Is that all right? Okay, the power of loving deeds. Second thing, the power of loving deeds. The clan leader, Leland, had a son who was Down syndrome. He was in a psychiatric ward. Um, was, was not a high-functioning Down syndrome child. Um, and he would go and visit him uh, with his daughter, with his wife from time to time. The one thing I, I admire about the clan's a uh, Klansman leader is that he was a man who took care of his family. Uh, visited his son on a regular basis, cared about his disabled son, treated his family well. Um, he, he did a good job with that. And he, they would show him going to visit his son on a fairly regular basis. He would feed his son, he would hug his son, kiss his son, and speak to his son in a very, very kind and gentle way. One day, his daughter ran into his shop. He was a garage owner, sold gas, and uh, sold minor parts for cars like belts and, and those kinds of things for um, the whatever, timing chain kind of, you know. I'm not a mechanic, so forgive me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So just minor stuff. They didn't look like they did major stuff. They just sold minor stuff. He ran a gas station. His daughter runs in and tells him uh, that he needs to come quick. Uh, something's happening at the psychiatric hospital with his son. When they get there, uh, they find out uh, that they had moved another patient into uh, this room. I guess the patient that was with his son that was real, real mild, uh, they had moved him out and brought in this other patient that was just going berserk. And it was really affecting his son. His son was starting to freak out and do all kinds of crazy things. And he was pleading with the people to get this uh, other patient out of the room. And he was willing to pay for a private room. But the Klan leader was just as broke as a lot of the poor black people in the community. And he didn't have the money to move him. As a matter of fact, when, when he asked the lady, can you put him in a private room? I'm willing to pay for a private room. She said the, the, the price is $75 a week additionally for you to do that. Well, this is 30, so, you know, this is 1971. They didn't have a whole lot of money. So he, he reaches in his pocket. He brings out $16.35 and lays it on the counter. That was all he had. He didn't have any more money than that, and he couldn't do it. As the Klan leader in the community, they wouldn't respond to him. 
He couldn't affect it. He couldn't make it happen. One day, as they were taking a break uh, from their charrette, uh, he went into the school office to use the phone, and he was talking to his wife and te- telling her and explaining to her what had happened, and uh, he was just stressed out that he couldn't do anything about it. Ann Atwater happened to walk down the hall, and she heard what was going on. And she decided to call in a favor with somebody she knew at the psychiatric hospital. Now watch this now. Come on now. Come on with me. Are you still with me? This man had been calling her the N-word. Come on, somebody. Talking about her people, talking about how they, they do this and do that and do this. She's, she's thinking, what can I do to affect change with what's happening with his son to better the situation for his son and for his family? This, this woman was a woman of influence, and she went to the psychiatric hospital, didn't ask him, didn't mention it to him, went to the psychiatric hospital. The head person in the hospital was a white lady that ran the place, and she's, the lady stepped to the window and said, how can I help you? She said, you cannot help me, but Bernadette can. Bernadette was African American. She knew that she wasn't going to get anywhere dealing with this woman. So, so she called out Bernadette and Bernadette came to talk to her. So Ann started to talk to Bernadette. I need a favor. Now I don't know because the movie never tells us whether or not they literally collected money from the community and the African American community to pay for a private room but she got this, his son into a private room that he himself could not affect. Oh help me Holy Ghost. When he found out that she had done this, as prideful as he was, he stormed into the room while she was at the table where they ate and said, listen, I don't want you doing anything for me. I mean, he's still just as, as gruff and mean and prejudiced. I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want you to do anything for me and my family. And Ann said, I didn't do it for you. <laughs> she was tough as nails. <laughs> she was tough as nails. But watch this now. It's beginning to impact him. It's beginning to affect him that somebody who should be, you know, up in his face wanting to fight and wanting to go crazy would do something like that for his family. His wife was just a loving woman. She decided to make up some jelly and took it over to Ann Atwater's house and, and, and gave her a jar just to thank her for what she did to get her son in a private room. And when C.P. Ellis heard what she did, he was upset that she would do it. Come on, somebody. Come on, some. The power of loving deeds. Come on, somebody. Watch this now. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head or you'll cause him to feel convicted for his ugliness and his mean deeds and he'll begin to change his whole mind about what you're doing for him. Come on, somebody. If we want to affect change in our communities, especially in a diverse community, we're going to have to understand how to love our enemies. Jesus said in Matthew 5, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, or that you may reflect who your Father is and how he operates dealing with people. Come on, are you still with me? Are you still with me? All right, I'm, I, I got you on the edge of your seat. So that's where I'm going to end because I know you'll come back. I know you'll come back next week. Come on now. I got you right where I want you now. I know you're going to come back next week. But I want you to to hear the end of this story. Now some of you say, well, I'm going to go watch the movie before next week, Pastor, so I'll know what the end of the story is. I want to talk about the power of truth and justice. And then I'm going to talk about the power of forgiveness and grace in relationship to what happens in the movie. Remember, the movie is a true story. It's not fictional. 
As a matter of fact, the participants, these people that were a part of all of this, helped to write the book to give the facts about what happened, including the Klan leader. And so we know that all of the stuff, the Klan leader and Ann Atwater are dead now, they're deceased, but at least we got the facts in a book that was written that all of them literally said, yeah, that's what actually happened, and that's what was said, and that's what was done. We'll come together next week, we'll deal with this issue, and uh, we'll see how best we can love our enemies. Is that all right? Amen, amen. Let's stand together, we're going to pray.